Good evening. Good evening. Welcome again to Edible Education 101. This is our third class meeting. I'm Will Rosenzweig. I'm really happy to be with you tonight. Thanks for your patience. We have a really special guest tonight. I'm very excited about tonight's class. Um, you know, I don't know if you notice this, but each week I've been starting off with a, uh, a picture, an image, something that inspires me. These are Meyer lemons. These actually, if you pay attention each week, sometimes the fruit on this stage is the same fruit in the bowl. These are from my garden. So how many of you saw this? You know what that is? That's a blue moon. Once in a blue moon, Edible Education meets. How many people have been under a blue moon or know what a blue moon is? Okay, this is your, this is your moment to integrate a little bit more with nature, like get out from inside the building or your cell phone. A blue moon is a full moon that happens twice in one month. It's a very rare occurrence and it's an important occurrence for gardeners and farmers because traditionally, a lot of times people would plant on the night of the full moon because they could both see what they were doing. And there was also some both scientific and apocryphal uh, reasons that planting in those cycles would produce a better harvest. So tonight is an auspicious night. And uh, I hope that when you go outside tonight after class, you'll take a moment to really peer at the moon and, and, and maybe receive some information. So tonight, Saru Jayaraman is going to be here. Saru, Saru is going to help us understand how movements move. And, um, you know, leading up to that, I just wanted to, to reflect a little bit on where we've been and where we're going in the class. And as you know, food is different than everything else. It's very personal. It's individual. It's really the substance that connects us personally to our health and personally to the planet's health. And so it's this very interesting place to be studying and working. And one of the things I love about this class is that there are people from all across the campus studying different fields, and you're coming together here tonight. Remember last week, I asked you to picture your last meal and talk about it with someone next to you. What I'd like you to do now is take a deep breath, close your eyes, and I want you to think for about 30 seconds of something that makes you really happy. Not just, you know, kind of tentatively happy or passingly happy, but what makes you deeply happy? Okay, think about that for a, for a few seconds, reflect on it. I can tell when you get it because I see these faces change. Seeing a few smiles now. If you really hit on something happy, your face is going to change. So keep searching for it. And when you lock onto it, bring it to life. Okay? Now, if you want, take a second and note it down on a piece of paper or write it on your hand or wherever you want. Just think about it. It's going to become important because, you know, in this class, our intention really is to develop this sense of becoming an enlightened eater. What does it mean to be an enlightened eater? And, you know, I was thinking today about the difference between an objective and an intention. You know, when you get the class evaluation for Edible Education 101, which we'll do toward the end of the semester, it's going to say, did you understand the objectives of the class, the learning objectives? Well, an objective is something that you sort of achieve or gain or hold. Um, it's very specific. It's kind of like a goal. But, you know, an intention is more about something you set yourself to. It's like a directionality. And it infers that you have a sense of kind of commitment behind it, like almost a sense of purpose. So I'd like you to think about the intention of this class of actually becoming an enlightened eater. And what we talked about is 
becoming an enlightened eater requires kind of a self-awareness, a self-knowledge. And we've started to ask these questions in the class about, you know, what are your tastes and preferences? Where, do you, where does your food come from? How does it get to the plate? Who's handling it? How is it grown? And these are bringing out questions like, okay, well, what are your core values? What do you believe in? And what are your mental models of the world? How, what do you hold? What do you think? What are the things you take for granted in the way you think about things? And now I want you to start this week in food. I want you to start thinking about like, well, what kind of riles you up? What, what troubles you? What bothers you? What, what problem in your own life would you like to solve? And then what's your vision maybe for a, an alternative to the way it is now? And then I'm going to start to talk to you this semester about what's your theory of change. And we'll go into more about that. In order to concoct a vision and a theory of change, you really have to have an understanding of the system. Last week, we started to introduce you to the systems theory and how things are interconnected. Um, the week before that, Alice introduced you to kind of vision and values along with Eric and a theory of change. Vi you know, Alice articulated this bold vision that every child would get a free school lunch and that that lunch would be grown and provided by local farmers. That was an incredible vision. And embedded in that vision were a bunch of values about eating together, about cooking ourselves, about making food part of every educational experience. And her theory of change connected to that too. Her theory was if you start young with people, if you start when they're growing up and you can influence their, their tastes, their preferences, their habits, their practices, their values, to get them to appreciate growing food, cooking food, and understanding the system of food that they participate in, that you will transform the entire culture. That's her theory of change. We also started to dance with systems. You read this wonderful article by Danella Meadows, Dancing with Systems, and I was thinking about the last couple weeks. Um, what attributes has she been talking about that kind of you know, stood out to me. And I thought number six, this idea of locating responsibility in the system is really important. And both Eric um, and Alice and Professor um, Brown talked about that last week and Margiana did as well. Also this idea of expanding time horizons rather than thinking so short term and immediate, thinking you know, generationally is so important in food. Expanding thought horizons, boy, Professor Brown stretched my thinking with Buddhist economics last, last week. I was sitting there thinking, and I, I know a lot of you were too, you were thinking like, how does this, how does this work? You know, you're thinking, but she was, she was stressing these ideas of, um, you know, this recognition that everything is interdependent. We're all interdependent. We're all interconnected. We're interconnected with our food system on a very personal and intimate basis and that care and concern for other people and all living things really is a human quality. And I know one or two of you were sort of challenging that too, but um, so she was stretching our own mental models and she also reminded us, I think what was important is that the capitalistic system that we live in, that drives us, that makes us so busy and kind of habituates our consumption, it's a human construction. It doesn't occur in nature. And that's a little bit mind-bending. You know, and then um, what was interesting was one of your classmates stood up at the question and answer and bravely said, how do we make this real? It's like, I like all this, I get I get Chez Panisse, it's a famous restaurant that serves food for wealthy people. And I get Professor Brown's big vision of Buddhist economics, but Ella said, how do we make this real? And I just really appreciated that comment. 
And it made me think a lot about this class and what we can do in this class together. And I thought, what can I do for this class that I think a lot about and, and work in a lot? And that is, how do you translate vision into action? How do you manifest, cultivate change for the better? And so what I'm going to try to do this semester is bring you some of the kind of entrepreneurial skill sets and mindsets and tool sets that I've been practicing for like 30 or 35 years that work about how you actually create change. And I'm going to challenge our speakers to build on that and add to that. And so I hope you'll not only learn about the food system and the people that are shaping it and thinking about it and working in it, but I hope you'll take away now as an intention this ability to actually make a difference, okay? So tonight I thought I would just share with you this first, call it an entrepreneurial tool set, okay? So making change, translating vision into action starts with the act of reflection. Now before you can reflect on what you're learning, you have to be able to listen. So listening is a prerequisite. I appreciate you're here tonight. You're here after a long day. You're already listening. There's already a lot of people listening out on our live stream. And so paying attention and listening and listening for patterns, listening for common ideas. So that's the first step is listening and then to reflect. So what I try to do when I'm working on a problem is I write down what resonates with me. What, what makes me buzz a little bit inside? Like what has meaning? What has heart and meaning for me? I write that down. I reflect on it. I don't try to turn it into a goal. I don't make it into a job. I just, I take a certain amount of time. You could call it meditation. You can call it, call it taking a shower. You can call it going for a walk. But it's actually a time of active reflection. Then the next step is you're reflecting and then what you start to do is you start to connect disparate ideas, disparate conversations from disparate classes, from disparate speakers, from different areas of expertise and influence. And you start making connections between conversations and ideas that don't ordinarily take place. So you're taking a, cl a class in the public policy school, and then all of a sudden you're taking a class in the business school, and then you're taking a class in the engineering school, and you start to connect these sort of common themes and common areas of resonance. So that's the next step. And, and it's also that recognition of bringing your systems intelligence to start to understand those connections. So once you reflect and then you start connecting, then the next step is you're gonna to start to integrate those disparate ideas that you've connected. And then from that, you're gonna create and innovate. And I'm gonna unpack this last one in a subsequent class. This is like a lot in this last one, but I just wanted to show you this process of reflect, connect, integrate, create, and innovate, okay? And I think you'll hear quite a bit more about that tonight. So I was thinking about the last two classes, and I was thinking about what resonated with me, and I thought with, you know, what Eric was really talking about, you know, he told this story about how he was, you know, an, uh, an independent journalist, an investigative journalist. He gets this call from the Rolling Stone magazine, says, hey, we'd like you to look into this meat packing industry. There's a lot of opacity and we think there's a story there. He didn't really know anything about it. And all of a sudden he just completely serendipitously, he gets the call. And you know, the call is like the beginning of the hero's journey. And so 20 years ago, he gets a call to do a story about food and the food system, turns into this big story in Rolling Stone, which then turns into a book which then turns into a movie and which turns into sort of like a 20 year, you know, journey, odyssey for him in being a voice of change and um, illumination in the food industry. So 
But the word that he kept using and his instruction to us was really about compassion. And I started thinking compassion is really something that um, you know, we need more of. We certainly need more of it as a, as a, a solvent, as a, as, a, as a catalyst for making change in a very polarized and stratified culture that we live in now. And then I started thinking about Claire Brown and, you know, she was so great. She, I, I think of her as a wise elder, you know, and she, she's been here at Berkeley since 1974. And she told you that story about how she and her friends used to make you know, get together and make soup. And she still makes soup on Thursday because the farmer's market's on Friday and she's got all that stuff in her fridge. So she said, you know, let's make soup. So then I thought, all right, why don't we figure out what is gonna be the compassion soup of this class? So I wanted to invite you to start thinking about this week, how to create your own recipe for creativity, innovation, change, in your own life. I want you to think about this idea of being an enlightened eater, the intention of being a light, an enlightened eater and developing food systems intelligence. And you know, maybe as the semester goes on, we'll share these recipes of where people are making unusual connections and recognizing patterns, okay? So that's where we've been just for two meetings and now we're in the third. And uh, now I'm going to ask Amanda to do the uh, attendance question. So if you can get your eye clicker out, that would be fantastic. Here's the question. Can you all see it? I'll read it to you. This relates to Saru's reading from her book, Forked. The restaurant industry, A, is currently the second largest and fastest growing employer industry sector in the United States. B, perpetuates a legacy of slavery by paying its own workers a menial wage because they earn tips. C, uses the federal minimum wage of $2.13, which has remained steady for almost 25 years. And D, all of the above. So please put your answer in your eye clicker so we can record your... Don't you love how people change their answer as soon as they... Okay, well, I think we have... Uh... Who's, who's E out there? I want to know who the wise guy is. Okay, well, that's... Rohini, is that the right answer? No, D. Yeah, D is the right answer, so... Okay, thank you. So... Um... We're really grateful tonight to have a, uh, a very um, really inspiring, committed leader who works right here on campus, Saru. She um, is the co-founder and the co-director of the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, which is a very dynamic organization working on a lot of restaurant industry issues. Saru was kind enough to be here with us last year. And um, I remember that night very vividly because uh, it was the night before, was it Andy Pudzer? Yeah, so Andy Pudzer was about to be, Andrew Pudzer, who had been chairman of Carl's Jr., was about to be confirmed as Secretary of Commerce in the Labor, Secretary of Labor in the Trump administration. And you came up here and said, not while I'm on my watch. <laughs> and you described a lot of the things that you were doing to bring to light the practices that his company, among others, condoned. And I, rem I remember vividly, because you flashed, you went on Google Pictures and you said, look at the Carl's Jr. ads. And you showed sort of a bunch of pictures of scantily clad people, including I think Stormy Daniels was one. <laughs> but Saru is now a real celebrity. I couldn't help myself. Saru, <laughs> for those of you that watched the Golden Globes the other night, Saru made a wonderful appearance with Aunt Amy Poehler and um, is now I think being recognized as you know, a force for good in the entertainment industry is, <laughs> is embracing her. So now you've got fans on campus. You've got fans in all of the 
restaurant community and now in Hollywood as well. So let's give a warm welcome to Saru Jayaraman. You want me to sit here? You can speak okay. from there and then, then we'll sit. When you're done, we can okay. sit down there. Cool. Well, hi, everybody. Can you, you can hear me okay? You can stand out here. You might be better on camera. So wherever you're comfortable, yeah. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me okay? I'm a little under the weather, so um, let me know if you can't hear me. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak um, in this class. Um, you know, I have to confess that I myself didn't know any of the issues that I now work on, you know, every day, all day, all day long, all night long. Um, I myself didn't know these things when I was in your shoes in school. And even after that, I went to law school and graduate school on the East Coast. And after law school and graduate school, I lived in New York and I worked at an immigrant worker organizing center as an attorney and an organizer. And I would eat out. I lived in New York. I would eat out. I would eat out every meal, sometimes three times a day, sometimes more. I would eat out. I would enjoy everything that New York City had to offer. And yet for all of those years of eating out, I myself can't recall a single moment, a single person who served my food or who cooked my food. I, I can't recall individuals. And I would say that's very purposeful. The industry is this invisible workforce that serves us while we enjoy, you know, we enjoy restaurants as the place of American culture. We eat out as Americans more than anybody else on earth, literally and statistically. And it keeps growing, the amount with which we eat out, the amount of workers in this industry. And yet for most of us, we know very little about what's happening in the restaurant industry. And that, that was true for me. And then 9-11 happened and it changed my life and it changed most people's lives around the world. Um, but on 9-11, there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One, called Windows on the World. It was on the 107th and 108th floor of Tower One. And on that morning, 73 workers died in the restaurant. They either jumped to their deaths because the plane hit below um, where the restaurant was on t in Tower One. And so they either jumped to their deaths from the 107th and 108th floor, or they were literally evaporated inside the restaurant because the, the heat from the plane below them rose so quickly and they, and they perished. So I was asked as a very young attorney, very young person, you know, shortly after the tragedy to start this organization in the aftermath of the tragedy that could help the families of the victims and that could help workers get back on their feet. 250 workers lost their jobs in that one restaurant, and about 13,000 restaurant workers lost their jobs in the months and weeks that followed. And so I started this little relief center as a very young person um, with you know, all of these workers who had no place to go. And what started as a little relief center post 9-11 has grown over the last now 16 years since 9-11, 17 years almost, into a national organization called ROC, Restaurant Opportunity Centers United. We now have about 30,000 workers across the country, about 500 restaurant owner members, ranging from Danny Meyer and Tom Colicchio, star of Top Chef, and Alice is a member of our association, and lots of great restaurant owners around the country, down to small mom and pop restaurants who are really doing their best to both do well by their customers and by themselves and by their workers. We also have about 23,000 consumer members and we're in 10 states. So we've grown geographically, we've grown numerically, but most interestingly, we've grown in terms of our stakeholder base. We started as a worker organization and then opened our arms and became a worker employer organization and then opened our arms even further and became a worker employer and consumer organization fighting for better wages and working conditions in this industry. <clears throat> and our growth and our expansion has paralleled the explosion in this industry. You know, you are looking at the food system as a whole in this class. There are 20 million workers in the entire food system. As a system, it is the largest employer in the United States. One in five private sector workers in the U.S. works in food. One in six American workers, period, public or private, works in food, whether it be farm work or food retail or manufacturing, you know, processing the food or transporting the food or restaurants. But of that 20 million workforce, a full 13 million, 13 million are in one industry, the restaurant industry. 
The restaurant industry is not just the biggest part of the food system, it's the almost the biggest part of the entire economy. It's the second largest private sector employer, but it is the fat number one fastest growing employer, which means <clears throat> we will soon surpass all other sectors as the largest industry in the United States. The problem, though, is that as large as we are, as fast as we're growing, we continue to be, as the restaurant industry, the absolute lowest paying employer in the US. So every year, the Department of Labor puts out a list of the 10 lowest paying jobs. Every year, seven of the 10 lowest paying jobs in America are restaurant jobs. People don't know this, but you know, four of the seven lowest paying jobs in the United States are actually tipped occupations, even when you take tips into account. So servers, and you may not know it living in, Bar in Berkeley or, or in San Francisco, but tipped workers across America are some of the poorest workers in America, even when you take tips into account. So how is it that you've got one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America proliferating the lowest paying jobs? And by the way, what does it mean for America to have the largest and fastest growing industry proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs? Let's stop and just think about that. What does it mean when the largest and fastest growing industry has the absolute floor of the economy jobs? Not that they aren't really skilled jobs, not that we shouldn't be valuing them as the professional jobs that they are, but they are paid the least. They're paid the least of any job in America. So what does it mean when you've got the largest and fastest growing industry proliferating the lowest paying jobs? It means that we are close to, we are one in three working Americans right now, one in three working Americans works full time and lives in poverty. And if any of you know what it's like to be a working American living in poverty, you know you don't work one job, you don't work full time, you work two and three jobs, you work way more than full time. So what, you know, one in three working Americans is working full time or more than full time and living in poverty, and we are getting very close in the next couple of years to it being one in two. One in two working Americans, working full-time or more than full-time and living in poverty. And even if you couldn't give a rat's behind, excuse my language, about anything I have to say tonight about workers, even if you couldn't care less about workers, about the people who produce and serve the food that you are talking about in this class, even if you couldn't care at all, <clears throat> you do need to think as an American about what it means when half of America doesn't have money to eat, can't afford to consume, cannot afford to eat out, can't afford to feed their families. What does that mean for the GDP of this country? What does it mean for any business, sustainable or not, and its ability to survive when half of America can't consume? What does it mean for the future of our nation when half of the country is eligible for public assistance and must rely on the other half to survive? What does it mean? It means we're going nowhere very fast. It means that any business you might think about will fail, including the restaurant industry itself is beginning to stagnate in certain parts because workers in this industry cannot afford to eat out. So how is it? How have we gotten to this point where you've got the second largest and absolute fastest growing sector of the economy proliferating the absolute lowest paying jobs. We've gotten to this point not because it is inherent and organic for restaurants to pay the least wages of any business, no. We've gotten here because of the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. It represents the Fortune 500 chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the McDonald's, this entity has been named the 10th most powerful lobbying group in Congress. It's actually you know, one of the most powerful lobbying groups that nobody has ever heard about, which is why we call it the other NRA. So you know <laughs> it's not the Rifle Association, but it's almost as powerful in Congress and in every state legislature across the country. And I had always thought, I have to be honest, until about four or five years ago, I had always thought the other NRA has been around maybe 30, maybe 40, at most 50 years. It couldn't have been around that long. These chains couldn't have been around that long. But oh no, the other NRA has been around, as it turns out, in doing research for my last book, in some form or another for 150 years since the emancipation of the slaves. 
because it turns out that tipping as a practice didn't originate in the United States, it originated in feudal Europe. So think of Downton Abbey, or if you read any old English literature, if you ever see any period pieces or period movies, Jane Austen or any other movies, you might see references to tipping. It was noblesse oblige. It was something that an aristocrat or a noble gave to a serf or a vassal, always on top of a wage. Serfs and vassals in feudal Europe actually got paid a wage, but tips were on top of that. They were a bonus or a gift, something that an, a, a, a superior would give to an inferior, but always uh, on top of a wage. So that idea of a tip came to the United States in the 1850s and the 1860s when rich Americans traveled to Europe and came back and tried to show off that they knew the rules of Europe and there was massive populist resistance. They said, people in America said, this is undemocratic, it's un-American. We don't tip here. We should get good service regardless of how much you can afford to tip. And by the way, employers should pay their workers, not customers. And actually six states in the United States passed complete prohibitions on tipping. And if you've taken American history, you may have learned about Alexis de Tocqueville who came to the United States, a French you know, writer came to the States and wrote about American democracy. And one of the things he wrote about is American democracy is so great because they don't tip in America. They got rid of this vestige of the feudal system. They don't tip in America. And that movement, anti-tipping movement spread to Europe. And the labor movement picked it up in Europe and got rid of tipping in Europe, dismissed it as a, as a vestige of the feudal system. They said, we are professionals. Don't you dare tip us. We are hospitality professionals. But here in the States, we went in the exact opposite direction because the restaurant industry demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves and not pay them anything at all and let them live on customer tips. And that idea that a newly freed slave, a black worker, could get a zero dollar wage was then made law. The first minimum wage law that passed in 1938 as part of the New Deal said tipped workers alone could get a zero dollar wage as long as tips brought them to the wage that everybody else got through the new minimum wage law. And we went from $0 in 1938 to a whopping $2.13 an hour in 2018. We are literally celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Fair Labor Standards Act this year. We as tipped workers have gotten a $2 increase over 80 years. It is between $2 and $7 in 43 states in the United States. And the Restaurant Association has essentially gotten away with saying we shouldn't have to pay our own workers. You, the customer, should pay our workers' wages for us. They've gotten away with that incredible idea, arguing it's totally okay. These are white guys working in very fancy fine dining restaurants in Berkeley and San Francisco and Chicago. When I'm on television with them, they love to say they make $100,000 a year. They make $50 an hour. There's no reason they should get a wage. When in fact, 70% of tipped workers in the United States and in California and in every state in the US are actually women. And they're women who don't work at fancy fine dining restaurants. They're women who mostly work at IHOP and Applebee's and Olive Garden and very casual restaurants, very small restaurants and diners across America. Their median wage, including tips, is $9.50. They suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce. They use food stamps at double the rate, which means the women who put food on our tables in America can't actually afford to feed their own families. But the very worst part of this, for me as a woman, and a woman who is the mother of two little girls, and I hope for any woman or any conscious man in the United States, the worst part of this is that our industry has the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the United States, literally and statistically, because women in this country who live on two and three dollars an hour and more, but who live on these wages, must put up with anything and everything from the customer to feed their families and tips. 40% of tipped workers in the United States are single moms, 40%. These are moms feeding their families on tips. And 90% of the workers we've surveyed have said they have experienced sexual behavior in the restaurant that is scary or unwanted. They have experienced a customer grabbing them, touching them, saying uncomfortable things to them, 
And even worse, because they live on tips, the manager tells them, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, wear tighter clothing in order to make more money in tips. There are seven states that got rid of this system 42 years ago, including California. California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska. Got rid of this system many decades ago. These seven states, we've studied them, have higher restaurant sales per capita, higher job growth in the industry, higher job growth among tipped workers, higher rates of tipping, people tip better in the seven states that have a full wage with tips on top, and half the rate of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment isn't gone. We have the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry, here, even here in California in the restaurant industry. But it is half the rate here in California as it is in New York or Washington DC where the wage is $3 an hour or Massachusetts where the wage is $3 an hour or Pennsylvania where the wage is $2.83 an hour or New Mexico where the wage is $2.13 an hour. We have half the rate of harassment here because here at the very least a woman gets a full wage from her boss. She knows she doesn't have to put up with anything and everything from the customer. And we found not only do we have half the rate of harassment, we have women being told by managers, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, wear tighter clothing, at one third the rate in California, as in all of our neighboring states. Again, because a manager can't tell a woman that when she gets a full wage from her boss. In these other states, what you have to understand, I mean, this is true in California too, but it's much worse in these other states. In these other states, you have to understand that women in this industry are not told to put up with harassment. No, they are encouraged to encourage harassment. They are encouraged to go out and get harassed because the more you get a man to harass you, the more successful as a worker you are. That is why you are told, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, wear tighter clothing in order to make more money in tips. And as a tipped worker, I mean, one of the things that really got to me over the last couple of months as we've gotten so much attention as because of the Me Too moment and we're seeing things start to change. I had a, a worker in Boston where the wages, again, $3 an hour in Massachusetts. I had a woman in Boston tell me, Saru, you, you, don't, you don't understand how bad it is. It isn't just that we have to put up with everything from the customer. No, because we're living on tips, that means every man in the restaurant has incredible power over us. So that we know, the, the guys in the kitchen know we have to produce something to please the customer. And so they know they have power over us in the kitchen because we're the ones who live on tips. The managers know they have power over us in terms of giving us the best shifts and the best tables. Everybody, all the men know they have power over us because our wage is not secure because everything depends on how much we please that customer. And so every man in the restaurant has power over us, not just the customers, but also the coworkers and the managers. And maybe even worse, or just as bad, this isn't just the millions of women that put up with this every day of their lives to feed their families. Millions and millions, we're the largest industry after all. No, it's millions more young women for whom this is the first job in high school or college or graduate school. This is how they're introduced to the world of work. One in two American women, one in two American adults, half of American adults work in this industry at some point in their lifetime. Half of American adults, half of American women, including Amy Poehler, who I went to the Golden Globes with, including Meryl Streep, who I was at the Golden Globes with, including Kerry Washington, who I was at the Golden Globes with, including senators, including lawyers and doctors, all of whom everybody I've named has told me, I have experienced harassment more recently in my current job, but I didn't do anything about it because it was never as bad as it was when I was a young woman working in restaurants. Which means what? It means our industry isn't just the worst on this issue, it isn't just that we set the standard you know, in terms of being the worst, in terms of harassment. We set the standard for the whole economy because women, most women start their lives here and they learn what's acceptable and tolerable, ethical, how they can succeed in this workplace, a workplace in which they are told, you must subject yourself to objectification in order to do well on the job. It's also the industry though, and this is why we're getting so much attention from Hollywood, it's also the industry with the clearest policy solution. We have a very clear policy solution. 
pay these women an actual wage with tips on top of that as it was in feudal Europe and you could cut harassment in half. A very clear policy solution. So clear that when we launched the campaign in 2013, we called it One Fair Wage. We spent the last several years since 2013 educating people on all the issues I just told you about. In 2015, the president of the Ford Foundation sat me down with Danny Meyer. How many people know who Danny Meyer is? A few people. Danny Meyer is probably the foremost fine dining restaurant owner in the United States. He's founded Shake Shack, but he also is the founder of the Union Square Hospitality Group. He started all the restaurants surrounding Union Square in New York City. He's written several books on the industry. Most fine dining employers in the United States know who Danny Meyer is. CM has a legendary standard setter for the industry. So I sat down with Danny Meyer. I said, you know, I told him everything I just told you, the legacy of slavery, the sexual harassment. He said, you know what? I've actually hated this system for decades, and you've given me the impetus to do something about it. And he invited me to come speak to all of his managers from all of his restaurants. And the general manager of the Modern at the MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was there. And he got very inspired. He said, I want to be the first restaurant in our company to make a change. And they decided as a company not just to get rid of the lower wage for tipped workers, which at the time was 5 or $6 an hour in New York City, not just to get rid of that lower wage, pay everybody a full wage, they actually said, we want to go way beyond that and get rid of tipping altogether. We want to be professionals in this company. We want to pay our people as professionals that they are. And so we want actually to go beyond what you're asking for and actually pay everybody a livable wage. And we said, we support that if you can guarantee that nobody actually earns less than they used to earn with tips, that everybody is doing better, the same or better. And they said, we guarantee that. And so we were supportive of Danny Meyer's move. All of his restaurants went tipless. The day after he announced, the New York Times published an op-ed by me on the his slave history of tipping and the tip minimum wage. And we've counted since that time almost 300 restaurant companies across the country follow, work with us, follow this move, either get rid of the lower wage for tipped workers or tipping all together. So we've had enormous success with lots of amazing restaurant owners across the country, Danny Meyer, Tom Colicchio, Zingerman's in Michigan, lots of amazing restaurants in Chicago, even in the South and North Carolina. We've been helping them figure out how to get rid of this old antiquated model, move towards a different system. But what we knew we really needed was policy change. If these seven states could change this policy-wise, why couldn't the rest of the country? And we kept fighting for policy change over and over again until the Me Too moment happened in the fall of last year. We suddenly got a lot of attention on all the research we had been doing on these issues for many years. And right before Christmas, thanks to the Me Too moment, Governor Cuomo announced that he would make New York the eighth state in the union to completely eliminate the lower wage for tipped workers. It was a huge victory. We had been working to change this policy in New York for many, many years, but it took a moment. It took uh, you know, all of the momentum of the many years, plus this incredible attention suddenly on women and the importance of standing up for women and the importance of standing up against sexual harassment for a state leader to say it, the time has come. So we are now moving towards one fair wage in New York. One fair wage is on the ballot in Washington, DC for June 2018, and it's on the ballot in Michigan on the ballot, meaning people will vote on it in November 2018. It is polling above 80% in both places, meaning we will win. And we are seeing this extraordinary tipping point, no pun intended, where many, many states are starting to move away from the old system. Many employers are starting to move away from the old system. And it's taken years of organizing workers, women to stand up and share their stories, workers to stand up and share their stories, and a moment like this to finally shed light on everything that we had been doing for the last two decades. It hasn't come without a lot of pushback. The Restaurant Association was never going to take this lightly. They have been attacking and attacking and trying to shut us down. They've been following me around the country. They've created attack websites and put my children's pictures up on them. They've taken out full page ads in the USA Today and Wall Street Journal. They've sued us for tens of millions of dollars. They've got two congressional investigations into us. It's a real badge of honor. President Trump's Department of Labor has announced that they're trying to shut us down. 
all wonderful things. Um, uh, your professor mentioned that uh, we were fighting against President Trump's uh, Secretary of Labor when I spoke in the class last year. Um, his candidate for Secretary of Labor was this man named Andy Puzder, who was the head of Carl's Jr. Restaurants, and I, I showed these images that this guy had been responsible for creating at Carl's Jr. of practically naked women eating burgers. And we had surveyed a thousand Carl's Jr. workers across the country most of them are teenagers. Um, and we asked them of their experiences. So many of these girls, 15, 16, 18, 19, told us because of the ads, men would walk into the restaurant, say, you don't look like the girl in the ad, but I'll take you anyway, and follow them out into the parking lot or try to follow them home. In many cases, it led to assault. Young girls. We flew these girls. We surveyed 1,000 of them. We flew them to Washington, DC to do a shadow hearing with Senator Elizabeth Warren. And we got that man out. He is not the Secretary of Labor. Big victory. But more importantly, that happened after I came to speak to you. <laughs> so that was a big victory. But much more importantly, this, you know, I, for us, we've, we've been, been engaged in a lot of resistance. You should know that another wonderful thing that President Trump has done or is doing is proposed a new rule that would make tips the property of owners rather than workers. Uh, we've submitted 300,000 comments to the Department of Labor saying, no, tips should be the property of workers, not employers. It's pretty common sense, even from feudal times. That's how tips were, you know, always thought of, the property of workers. Um, doesn't matter. He will go ahead and make tips the property of owners in the United States. And that is why it's, it can't just be about resistance. It has to be about proactive power building. Every time we pass one of these state bills, like Governor Cuomo is going to pass in New York, or we're going to pass in DC or in Michigan, we not only get rid of the lower wage for tipped workers, we actually pass protective laws in those states, making tips the property of workers rather than employers. So wherever we win, workers get to keep their tips and they get an actual wage. So that is why, rather than just resisting, we are building a movement for change and we are seeing so many restaurant owners come our way. We are so, seeing so many state legislators come our way. We are seeing the public already agree with us for a very long time. This is a long fight. It's a, with a huge enemy, <laughs> um, but we are winning. Uh, and it's very, very exciting. And it's happening because of this extraordinary moment where both men and women are standing up and saying, really, time is up. Time's up. We, don't, we will not allow women to be treated in the workplace like this anymore. We will not stand for this legacy of slavery to be perpetuated. And we will not allow a trade association, above all else, a lobbying group for the nation's biggest chains to dictate how we live and how we eat out. We, the people, we will determine how we eat out. I'm going to stop there. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. You're such an inspiration. <laughs> so um, think about your questions, class, as you have Saru's attention for a few more minutes. Um, I'm struck by a couple things. One, um, the, the persistence it takes. And also, almost kind of the serendipity of the moment. I mean, you were here a year ago. We were all pretty rattled about the election. Um, you were doing your thing to just prevent this guy from getting appointed Secretary of Labor. But we had no idea that Me Too was not a meme right. or a hashtag. It uh, was actually, but was it wasn't it? a big thing. Okay, then, it was, yes, okay yes. so it, was, yeah. it wasn't sort of proliferating. Right. Um, so how do you, you know, where do you find sort of the, the faith, hope, courage like you can't count on you can't count on that moment coming. No. So what what sustains you? I mean, maybe mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that, and and also, you know, maybe illuminate just for the class that that I mentioned theory of change because you you have a theory of change here about your organizing. So maybe you could unpack that a little bit too. Sure. <clears throat> so um, first, it's important to note this is one moment of five hundred moments, right? There have been so many moments in this work. 
every time a worker joins our association and says, you know what, I want to stand up, I want to be part of collective change, I'm not afraid anymore, um, or uh, I, I actually, you know, I used to not agree with you and now I, I see we need to change this industry, or a restaurant owner says, you know, I totally didn't agree with you, but now I, I see this has got to be the future of the industry. Every time that happens, it's a thrill, it's a, it's a moment of inspiration. Um, but, you know, then there are bigger moments. This, you know, before this moment, there was the moment where Danny Meyer listened and said, I'm going to do it. Let's do it together. And then a lot of restaurant owners followed. Um, there have been other moments where states have said, you know, we're going to do this in the past or where legislators have joined forces with us. So there have been a lot of moments and maybe that speaks to the theory of change. The theory of change is collective power that you, in our case, we started with workers and we grew and grew and grew to have more and more workers and then we realized we were up against such a powerful enemy or villain or foe that it couldn't just be workers. We had to stand with employers, with restaurant owners as well, who, who agreed with us, who actually said, this is possible. There are ways of doing this. We don't have to say no, no, no to change. Actually, change is possible. And then we realized we needed consumers, you know, and we, in every moment, were willing to adapt. You know, at, over the course of the last 20 years, we've watched the food movement. We watched Eric Schlosser and Alice Waters, and we watched the food movement, you know, turn customers from not caring to caring about local and organic and we thought well if 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 we can actually help people expand their definition of sustainable food from just sustainable you know organic you know tomatoes and chickens to sustainable wages and working conditions for the people touching your food and producing it if we can expand that definition and replicate that movement's success and get consumers to care about these issues and act, there's a lot that could happen. So for us, the theory of change has always been collective prosperity. The idea that, you know, first it's workers saying we need to do better, and then it's workers and employers standing together and say we can do better together. And then it's workers, employers, and consumers saying we all will do better when workers do better. And, and these days we have employers who have worked with us to produce research that shows that, in fact, their bottom line is improved by paying better wages and working conditions. We worked with Cornell School of Hospitality Management. We surveyed 1,100 restaurant owners across the country. We quantified how much employee turnover costs restaurant owners by talking to them. You know, we have the highest rates of turnover. If any of you have ever, how many of you have ever worked in a restaurant? Yeah, most Americans have. <laughs> um, Restaurants have the highest employee turnover of any industry in the United States. Three, it's typically about 300%. That's three turns in one job in one year. That costs employers a lot of money. A lot of money in retraining, in rehiring, employee productivity, morale. I mean, you know what it's like to have a staff that's constantly changing. We showed that you can cut those costs in half by providing better wages and better working conditions. It makes sense. Workers stay with you longer if they know that they not only can be treated well, but they can move up a ladder. So we've worked with employers to show it's better for them when their workers do well. And we've worked with consumers who say it's better for us if our workers are treated well. It's not just about having that wonderful, delicious, organic meal. I want to make sure that the worker isn't sick and sneezing on my food, that they can take care of themselves when they serve me, that I'm not participating in a system as a consumer that treats women like this. As a consumer, I want to know that everything is ethical, not just the food. And so our theory of change has been this idea of collective prosperity. Everybody does better when everybody really does better. And that in every moment, it's important to show that another way is truly possible. It's not, it's not a theory. It's not, a, it's not hyperbole. We've got very large restaurants and very small restaurants that are paying $15 an hour and thriving, not just, not just making it, they're thriving. We've got small restaurants and big restaurants, fine dining and fast food and casual restaurants, 500 of them across the country who prove the point. You can do this and not go out of business. In fact, you can do well, not in spite of treating your workers well, but because you treat your workers well. I just, thank you. <laughs> I, I love the vision when you were talking, and I, I remember you mentioning it last year too, but the vision of collective prosperity really, to me, sort of, I thought, you know, that's beautiful. 
And, you know, we can um, assail all the wrongs and we need to know what's wrong. And I think also we need something to aspire to. So when you put out that notion of collective prosperity, I felt like that's, you know, that's aspirational and, and that really evokes this notion of being interconnected and interdependent. Because if I feel like the pain, you know, if the person who's serving me this or making me this is in pain and suffering, then I'm participating in something that is, you know, not appropriate. So I actually, knowing that you were going to come tonight, I brought um, a little book that I wanted to, I wanted to read you a little passage. Because we were, <laughs> we've been thinking a lot about what do we value, you know? And what's interesting in food is, um, there's an attribute of it, and we, we lose track of it in the speed that we're going, but the value of beauty, just the value of beauty and beauty and food. And, and next week, by the way, Dan Barber, the chef, Chef Dan Barber is going to be here, and he, you know, produces beautiful food. And he, I mean, when he produces, he just brings like these little vegetables out of the you know, garden, and that's it. It's just the beauty of the vegetable itself. But anyway, I wanted... I just wanted to share this with you because to give, give something back to you. This is an excerpt from a book called Beauty, Rediscovering the True Sources of Compassion, Serenity, and Hope. And it's by a gentleman named John O'Donohue, who was a well-known sort of um, Irish poet and philosopher. He's really a, a brilliant man, um, very thoughtful man. But just this little section for you, Saru. Sure. This is called <coughs> If Beauty Were Invited. Our times are driven by the inestimable energies of the mechanical mind, its achievements derived from its singular focus, linear direction and force. When it dominates, the habit of gentleness dies out. We become blind, nature is rifled, politics eschews vision and becomes the obsessive servant of economies and religion opts for the mathematics of system and forgets its mystical flame. Instead of true leadership, which would be the servant of vision and imagination, we have systems of puppetry which are carefully constructed and manipulated from elsewhere. We never know who we are dealing with. Hidden agendas operate to deepen our insecurity and persuade us to be hopeless. Our present dilemma is telescoped in this wonderful phrase from Irish writer and visionary <coughs> politician Michael Higgins, quote, the acceptance of inevitability in our lives is consistent, of course, with the suggestion there, that there is but one vision of the economy, an end of history, the death of ethics, and an appropriate individualism that eschews solidarity and any transcendent public values. Yet constant struggle leaves us tired and empty. Our struggle for reform needs to be tempered and balanced with a capacity for celebration. When we lose sight of beauty, our struggle becomes tired and functional. When we expect and engage the beautiful, a new fluency is set free within us and between us. The heart becomes rekindled and our lives brighten with unexpected courage. It is courage that restores hope to the heart. So one of the things that I so um, look to you for your, your spirit and your leadership is this sense of courage. And, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned, you know, when this professional work that you're doing becomes personal, it's really tough. I mean, and to have your children implicated and this is not playing fair. Um, I'm kind of interested in what you do to sustain your courage. Where does courage come from? How do we, you know, invoke the courage in each of us? Use the word consumer. I said this year I'm going to challenge every guest at Edible Education to think of the people who eat food not necessarily as consumers, but maybe as eaters mm -hmm. or sustainers or citizens or something. Because if we're, if we're stuck in the consumption model, we'll never get to yep. that beautiful image or that sustainable yeah, system. Totally. So I want to get rid of the word consumer in the food industry. We're not consumers. We need to be enlightened eaters. Yeah, totally. But so how do you think about courage? Where does it come from? How do you how do you generate it? How do you work up to it? If you're a student here, how do you how do you work up the courage to like ask the manager of the restaurant what their policy is? 
So um, I want to answer that question by first talking about another part of that quote, which is the opposite of courage to me, which is this idea of inevitability, right? That there is a inevitable way that things must be, and, and the industry perpetuates this very well because I'm sure there are many people in this classroom who have bought, very much bought into the idea that you cannot raise wages without jobs being lost. That is a common wisdom that the industry has perpetuated. You cannot raise wages without businesses suffering. You cannot raise wages without, you know, somehow the economy suffering. That's one myth that, you know, you can't run a small business um, and, and pay anything more than a certain amount uh, or you will not survive. There's no way to run a restaurant except to pay the lowest possible wage to your, to your, these are, these are facts <laughs> that have been distributed across American society as if they are facts and they just aren't. All of the evidence points in the opposite direction that in fact the states and cities with the highest wages have the fastest growing restaurant industries. The seven states that got rid of the lower wage for tipped workers have the fastest gro job growth among tipped workers and servers themselves. I mean, th this common wisdom that they love to spread is not actually wisdom and it's not evidence. The courage comes when you are able to stand up in a room of people who've accepted that as common wisdom and say, that is not common wisdom. That is actually not wisdom at all. That is mythology. And here is the truth. And sometimes it means people attack you. <laughs> it means they uh, put your children's pictures up on attack websites. It means they follow you around the country. At one point, um, somebody from within the National Restaurant Association leaked documents to Salon the uh, online magazine and the salon reporter <laughs> shared privately the documents with me. They were, the documents showed that the Restaurant Association had spent six million dollars to shut me down, shut Rock down, and he forwarded me the documents. They were pages and pages of my whereabouts. They had been following me around the country, wherever I spoke, wherever I traveled, they had been following me everywhere. So, um, you know, you could take that and stop. You could take that and say it's inevitable. You know, with, with sexual harassment, it's so amazing to me how many times for years before this Me Too moment, I had everybody in the industry, including women, say, well, that's just the way our industry is. That's what you do in this industry. You, you put out. You please the customer. That's just the way the industry is. You put up with it. So that's, an, again, that notion of inevitability and the courage comes when women say, time's up. Actually, no, it's not inevitable. We won't put up with it. You know, and even if it takes being attacked, what drives me when I'm attacked is I have two little girls. And I, to me, the restaurant industry could be so beautiful. I would be very proud of my daughters if they became restaurant industry professionals. If, if. By the time they grow up, we can fix this industry together. If by the time they grow up, they don't need to put up with a, an eater or a manager or a coworker touching them or talking to them in any, with anything less than 100% respect. So this industry is so beautiful. Talk about beauty. This is the most beautiful thing you can imagine, being able to come together over wonderful food, people serving each other, People serving each other with care and love and such skill and professionalism. What a beautiful thing. The thing that's not beautiful is the fact that these folks are not paid or treated as the professionals that they are. And so the courage comes from knowing that we can change it. It's not inevitable. We have to change it for the sake of my daughters and the women in this room and their daughters. We have to change it. The courage comes from knowing the status quo is not inevitable. Change is actually inevitable. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Come on. I love it. You know, there's, um, and we're going to come out to you now, so get ready. There's a mic there, and there's a mic over here. So if you want to come ask a question, please come down to the mic. Be courageous. This is your moment. <laughs> Um, you know, one, in, a, in a parallel part of the food industry, 
there's some movement with the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which is sort of not nearly as powerful as the other NRA, but, but a big lobbying group for the yeah. packaged food industry yeah. that has basically been the front whenever there's been a citizen's initiative for a soda a tax labeling. or GMO yeah. labeling or nutritional labeling. They're the ones that go out and say, oh, oh, oh no, no, it's going to be just too complicated for people. They won't understand. Or it's going to cost the food industry way too much to change the packaging or, right. or you know, it won't be fair to those small grocery stores to put a soda tax because their business depends on that. You're going to put them out of business. All the myths you're talking about. But just a few months ago, Campbell Soup says, we're done. Why? Because they're on the wrong side of the argument with the eaters. That's right. This eater power is like alive. And it's interesting with social media, now all of a sudden the brand is not controlled by the company, it's controlled by the customer. So we're in a whole new dynamic. And what I love about the way you approach things is you're so informed. You're, you're research driven, you're data driven. You're not sitting here presenting another myth. You're showing people like, here's where it works. Let's just figure out how it works, why it works. Let's replicate it. That's right. So I'm encouraged, you know, with this sort of fissure because Nestle, the world's largest food company just resigned from the oh, that's GMA. Great. And I think another big food company did too. So that's starting to crumble. And part of your theory of change and your strategy is in this realm of, um, we in business, we would call it the key influencer strategy. Mm -hmm. Danny Myers, right. a key influencer. He's, he's wildly successful. He's successful at the top end of the market, at the fast casual end of the market. Mm. He's a visionary. He's made a lot of money, but he's also been, you know, incredibly sort of, just and mission driven. So getting somebody like that as your as your ally. So I guess I have one more question around that. Like who's <coughs> who's next? Who do you need? How can we help you get, you know, do are we going after one of the big chains now? Or <laughs> um, where, where how do we how do we trip the dominoes for you or help? Um, honestly anybody you know who's a restaurant owner, anybody that you connect with as an eater, um, please encourage them to join our association. We, honestly, we would open our arms to the Applebee's and the IHOPs if they wanted to work with us to figure out how to raise their wages. We've had Panera call us. Chipotle has been in discussions with us. You know, we're not, we are not, uh, we, it's not like we believe anybody's evil or, and anybody's perfect. The, we call it, we don't, we call these high road and low road, if you read the first two chapters of my book, we call them roads for reason. These are not destinations. These are pathways that people are on. Anybody can change. You know, I've changed. Danny Meyer changed. Anybody can change. So um, fundamentally, as I said, change is possible. I believe it's inevitable. Uh, and, and it's possible for you all as eaters to connect restaurant owners, even those that you think might be the most opposed to this, to sit down with us and hear us out and, and, and be, you know, it's funny, you're talking about people breaking off. The Re National Restaurant Association has been very stuck, but the Golden Gate Restaurant Association, which is the San Francisco Restaurant Association, uh, reached out and we've been t working a lot together because a couple of years ago, they decided we've just, this isn't, we've had enough. You know, they, what the leadership said to me is, we were tired of always being the party of no. And, you know, we realized at some point people wanted change. And so rather than always being the party of no and being behind the ball and having to catch up as people made change, we decided to get out in front and say, okay, if you want this change, let's figure out how it can work for our industry. You know, let's work together and figure it out. And now I have people in Washington, restaurant owners in Washington, D.C. approaching the Restaurant Association of Washington, D.C. and other people approaching the National Restaurant Association and saying, we have got to stop being the party of no, it's not working. Change is inevitable. So um, any of you can be part of that by encouraging restaurant owners you know to work with us, to talk to us. And we made that easy. Um, the book you read, Forked, has a, an app version. 
you can go uh, to forkedthebook.com and there's a mobile site where we actually rate restaurants on their wages, benefits, and promotion practices. And you can show when you're eating out, you can show that mobile site to a restaurant owner and say, you know, I love eating here. I love the food. I love the service. I'd love to see you rate well in this, in this guide. And I can put you in touch with people who can help you either, you know, rate you well because you're already doing well or help you get there. That's great. So remember that change is inevitable. That's going to be on the final. <laughs> You've got a question over here. Please use the mic so everybody can hear. Just introduce yourself and... Speak into the mic, and that way everybody at home can hear you, too. Sounds good. Hi, my name is Grace. Uh, I'm a student, actually, in the College of Natural Resources, and I've seen you speak a few times in various classes. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I appreciate it every time. I, the, the, there's always new data that sticks. I feel like there's so many numbers <laughs> that you have in your head. And also, a few years ago, you kindly offered, actually, to speak with me on the phone over some organizing work that I was trying to get started. And one thing that always stuck with me is you said that our generation is afraid of direct action. And that really stuck with me, and I appreciate that so much. And it's pushed me. I mean, it's definitely played a role in pushing me to do more organizing work. Um, and I feel like what you're doing is definitely like when you're when those unfortunate things are happening like to your family and to you, it's like you know you're doing something right because you're like affecting power, and that's really amazing. My question is more specific around. Um, I've been curious about. When you talk about like negotiating, because you work with employers and workers, I'm just curious, how does that work when obviously there's this explicit like power dynamic, and when you're working within one restaurant or like a network of restaurants, and there is, you know, you're working with workers who are, and you're trying to mediate these issues around wage and harassment, how does that work like between the employers and those who are at a different power yeah. level? It's a great question because, um, as I mentioned, there are two pathways. Some people are on the high road and want to figure it out, and it doesn't mean that they're perfect. And so when workers come to us from a restaurant that we've been talking with and working with, we are able to sit down quietly with that employer and say, workers have come to us and expressed this issue. Um, let's, let's help you clean up so that you can correct what you're doing wrong. And employers who work with us are able to fix it quietly, positively, you know, and avoid, you know, bigger problems. But we've had other employers where workers come to us and say, I'm not being paid or my tips are being stolen or I'm being harassed. And we attempt to do exactly that. We send them a letter, say, let's sit down and talk. Your workers have approached us. Those restaurants often don't want to listen. And so we end up having to take it to the public. And that means direct action in front of the restaurants. It means litigation, suing the restaurants. It means encouraging eaters to actually speak to the restaurant owner, communicate to the restaurant owner, I'm not going to eat here, I need you to change your practices. Um, so direct action is extraordinarily powerful, especially when the people who are most affected, in this case the workers, are the ones leading the effort. And there are people who support them, like eaters and other allies, who stand with them and uh, go to the restaurant owner and say, we need, we need to see you change. And we've never had an instance, we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of these instances, we've never had an instance where the employer ultimately doesn't sit down, pay back the workers, uh, change their practices, um, hire people they fired. We've never not won because direct action is so powerful in actually getting employers to I mean, direct action in front of a restaurant, a restaurant relies on its ambiance and its location. They can't just close up shop and open in, you know, in another country. You know, they have to be where they are. And so direct action in front of a restaurant with workers appealing to the public and saying, we are not being treated well, is one of the most, is the most powerful thing out there. And so it's just an example of how you all, if you act collectively, you know, and I, I, since I said that, Trump was elected. And I think people are much more seeing the power of collective action and direct action and resistance. So maybe I was wrong. <laughs> and maybe your generation is totally, totally into direct, direct action and totally capable of it. Again, this is, a, this is part of this common wisdom thing. I think before Trump was elected, there was a bit of common wisdom of respectability. You know, it's not respectable to go out in the streets and protest. And now there's a common wisdom that we all have to get up and do something, otherwise we may actually be killed in a nuclear war, or we may actually 
you know, all lose our tips or things might happen. And so um, I do think things are changing and I think a lot more can be done. Thanks, Thank Grace. You. Any other questions? Come on, somebody else has got a question. Yeah, please. Hi, Saru. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm a first year in the full-time MBA program here. Um, and my question's around um, something that I would love to get your opinion on is we talked, uh, you talked a little bit about tipped workers. Um, would love to hear what you think about the pay gap between back of house, front of house, between tipped workers and non-tipped workers. And please correct me if this is, if I'm underestimating or overestimating the problem. But I mean, I guess, trying to understand from a restaurant's point of view that says we can't raise our wages, we, our margins are thin enough, we should, maybe this is where this misguided idea of a tip pulling comes into play where you can, we can redistribute the money around. Mm -hmm. what, what are policy implications? What are thoughts on how restaurants can address this? Great question. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is something that especially um, higher end restaurants bring up a lot, both those that are with us and in the National Restaurant Association. We can't raise wages for tipped workers or what they call the front of the house because the inequity between front and back is already so great. Sometimes they make it even uglier and they say we can't, we can't raise wages from the front of the house because those are white workers and the workers in the, in the back are people of color. Now, now that um, goes a little bit too far because I like to point out God didn't tell you to put white people in the front and people of color in the back. That is actually discrimination. That's called segregation. And that is another issue we need to fix in the restaurant industry. Um, but the other po big point is that, first of all, that inequity doesn't actually exist in the vast majority of restaurants where people work. Most workers don't work in fine dining. They work in Applebee's and Denny's and IHOP. In the vast majority of restaurants in America, there actually isn't that inequity between front and back because the women in the front, and they are mostly women, earn very, very little in tips and very little in wages. So when you look at median wages across the country, tipped workers and non-tipped workers actually make almost exactly the same, even taking tips into account. But the problem does exist. I totally see it and feel it and hear it uh, and have experienced it. The problem does exist in the higher end restaurants. We can't deny it. And so we actually do agree with what we call one fair wage plus sharing tips with the back. We do agree with that or moving to a model like Danny Myers, where the employer actually pays everybody's wages and can ensure a more equitable just, you know, wage between front and back where everybody's a professional and like every other profession, you know, please stop and think for a minute about all the other customer service professions in the United States. Why, why is it that you, you know, I hear customers sometimes saying there's the, I, we have to keep tips. There's no way to express pleasure or displeasure except with tips. There's no way to motivate servers except through tipping. No, I'm sorry. There's so many other professions where customers, people are served and where people are treated well and where people are motivated to treat people well and where customers can express their pleasure or displeasure. Teaching. Imagine if the University of California, Berkeley said to you, we shouldn't have to pay the professor's wages. You, the students, should pay their wages in gifts and tips that express your pleasure or displeasure with our teaching. Can you imagine your doctor, the hospital saying, we're not gonna pay the doctor's wages. You, the patients, pay the doctor's wages based on how happy you are with the doctor's services, what they tell you, the news they give you. So there's no other profession where that's true. And so uh, in a situation like Danny Myers, he did that in particular because he wanted to create greater equity between front and back. Other restaurants have moved to service charges, as you know, which are, problematic if the employer tries to keep a portion of the service charge, which happens all too often. And so we have passed laws in various places making service charges the sole property of the worker, not the employer. So in general, we believe, look, if there can be one fair wage, meaning the same minimum wage for front of house and back of house, certainly back of house workers can be paid way more than that, and tips can be shared between front and back. 
as happens in, men, in a lot of places in the seven states. You can create greater equity in multiple different ways, but it can't happen by having a lower wage for tipped workers, and it cannot happen by employers being able to keep any portion of the tips. So this is the problem with Trump's rule. The National Restaurant Association is arguing that this rule is good and okay and justified precisely for the reason you're saying. They're saying we should be able to keep and control the tips so that we can dis redistribute them because it's so inequitable between front and back. You can, re you can allow tips to be shared without managers and employers having any portion of those tips. There is no reason for a manager to be able to take those tips and turn around and buy a Mercedes. I mean, the, the rule actually states employers should be able to take tips to make capital improvements in the restaurants. You know, there's no reason for that. So there are ways to deal with inequity. Everything I've just said, plus I want to mention one more thing, which is if we're going to go there on the racial equity, let's go there. Let's talk about the fact that the Bay Area has the highest racial wage gap between white workers and workers of color of any restaurant industry anywhere in the United States. There is a $5.50 wage gap between white workers and workers of color here in the Bay Area, in the restaurant industry. And that is because workers of color are steered into lower level positions. They are the bussers and the dishwashers and the cooks, not the servers and the bartenders in fine dining. And they're steered into lower level segments like casual restaurants and fast food. And so white men end up in fine dining restaurants as servers and bartenders. We actually tested this. We sent 400 pairs of white and people of color applicants, men and women, into fine dining restaurants to see who would get hired. We found that white people had twice the chance of a person of color of getting a fine dining server or bartending position, even when the person of color had a better resume. We had many restaurants openly say, we don't hire women here, they can't carry trays. So, you know, if we're going to go there on equity, let's talk about equity, but let, let's address what we call implicit bias, which is the fact that employers steer workers into different positions based on their identity. And eaters participate in this because cons we hear from employers, well, my, the eater wants a certain kind of person as their sommelier or server or bartender because they can engage in a certain kind of table talk. That's coded language for a certain kind of uh, culture, <laughs> culture, shared culture. And there's no reason why a person of color can't learn wine and food pairings. There's no reason why, you know, we run training for people of color. We actually have gotten together with Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and we bought a building across from the Fruitvale BART station and we're opening a colors restaurant where we're training hundreds of low wage workers of color to move up the ladder. We did this in New York and Detroit. We opened our own restaurants called Colors and we train workers in them. One of the young men who went through our training programs in DC has become a master of wine. There are 75 masters of wine in the world. Only two are, are people of color. One is our guy <laughs> from Washington DC. There is no reason why a young man of color, even a formerly incarcerated person, couldn't become a master of wine or a sommelier or an owner. It is our implicit bias. It is the fact that we when we think about equity, we think about front and back, which is legitimate. We don't actually think about racial inequity, gender inequity. So if we're going to talk about equity, let's talk about all of it, and let's address all of it together. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So maybe just building on Kevin's question a little bit. Say I'm a young person. I've worked in restaurants since I was in high school, and I... I love the industry, but I've been kind of trained in this old model. I've seen it and I've seen it from the inside. I see like how hard it is to make a living. I see how much food is wasted. I see even for an owner of a small restaurant that's trying really hard, how hard it is to make ends meet. But I wanna come over. I wanna, I wanna join. Yeah. I wanna be on the right road with you. Does, does Rock, would Rock help me as like a small business owner, like even do the math and figure out like, what do I have to change in my pricing and my- Totally, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. I was on um, Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO last Friday and I had that guy, every time I'm on Bill Maher, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails, way more than I did from the Golden Globes. 
just hundreds of people writing to me, small business owners saying, I want to do this, I don't know how. Workers writing to me and saying, I agree with everything you're saying, but I don't understand how my small business employer could possibly imagine to make, you know, make this change. The restaurant would shut down. And our response to everybody is, come, come talk to us. We'll put you in touch with somebody who runs your same kind of restaurant in your state or a different state. We'll have you talk to them and see how they've done it and you can do it too. We'll help you open up your books and figure out how you can slowly make this change. We'll help you figure out your P&Ls. We'll help you figure out how to change your employment practices. We have model employee handbooks we can hand you. We can provide you with the support if you're willing to go down this new path, the high road to profitability. Again, nobody's perfect. Nobody's asking you to do it overnight, um, but join us. And when they join us, inevitably they find and they agree with us, we want to do this. We can start to make this move, but you know what would help a lot is if there was policy that made everybody do it at the same time rather than me alone. And so that's why, that's why I hope what you hear is not uh, we as eaters can affect change company by company by company, that that's the only solution. It's great that these companies have left the GMA and we need policy change. We need policy change fundamentally because it can't go company by company. It's got to be every, it's got to be a level playing field for the folks that are taking the high road. They can't be at a disadvantage for doing the right thing. Everybody's got to go up together. And these policies, by the way, are not asking people to go from two and three dollars to twelve and fifteen dollars overnight. They're phased in a dollar, fifty cents to a dollar year after year. And so um, they're phased in slowly. There's plenty of support. It's totally possible. And as I've said, the states that have passed these policies actually have booming restaurant industries. So if I'm a first or second year student here at Berkeley and I want to participate in what you're doing and get prepared, what should I be studying? What should I be majoring in? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you can major in anything. You should study anything and everything. That's what college is for. But if you care about these issues, I say I think the best thing to do is to get engaged now. Um, to get engaged, you know, if it's, if it's us, you can get engaged as a worker or an eater or a student, however you want to engage. There's plenty of ways to engage. Whatever issue it is you want to work on, get engaged now. And whatever it is that you're studying, think about the connection between what you're studying and what you're doing, um, because there's no better way to figure out what you want to do eventually than to actually get out there and try to do it or be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Saru. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you Thanks so a lot. Much. Yeah, thank yeah. you for having me. Um, can we have this slide, please? Again, just uh, a preview of next week. I don't have any control over that. Do you? Um, can you give me this slide uh, just so I can show? One second. Five seconds. So next week. Week four, uh, really very delighted to tell you that um, Chef Dan Barber uh, is going to be here. Chef Dan is um, highly respected. Uh, he's really visionary. He's much more than a chef. Um, Sorry. It's okay. And I've got a slide of him because I wanted you to see. If you have time this week... There's a wonderful Netflix series called Chef's Table, and he's on the first episode of that. And I would highly encourage you to grab a couple of friends and watch it because you'll get a sense of him at work that will, I think, really inform your experience to enjoy his presentation. And Dan's written a book called The Third Plate, and he has a vision that's very interesting that he sort of looks at the industrialization of our, uh, of our food system, and he's got a vision for where to take it. And he's working very, um, very actively with, with plants and seeds. And um, he's going to talk about regenerative cooking and from seeds to soul. If you hold on one second, I'm going to give you something. Yeah, no problem. So um, come back next week with Chef Dan. Um, if you'd like a lemon from the Idea Garden, help yourself. 
and we'll see you next week. Thanks very much. I'm so sorry. I need to it's okay. To, to I know.